Great, we are back, it's 12.55. I hope you had a, a good break and many thanks to uh, uh, Rex and Renee for doing such a fantastic panel and all of the panelists and the participants. So that was terrific. Um, we're now going into session two on uh, IT infrastructure. Our moderators are Carol Bolt and Christopher Shute. Please take it away. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Chris Shute from Johns Hopkins and Carol and I are going to co-moderate the discussion. I'm going to moderate these initial speakers and Carol has the hard part. She's going to wrap up at the end and uh, help us with the summary. Our first speaker today is, is Ken Wiley, Program Director in the Division of Met uh, Genomic Medicine at NHGRI. Uh, Ken, take it away, please. Thank you. Let me share my screen and then I will get started. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes, you're it's okay. all good, Ken. Oh, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I'm here to want to give an overview of the last genomic medicine meeting, uh, Genomic Medicine 13, developing a clinical genomic informatics research agenda. Um, and so um, this meeting was a virtual meeting that was uh, held last year on February 9th and 10th. And the goal of the meeting is actually to develop a uh, research strategy on using genomic-based clinical informatics tools and resources to improve the detection, treatment, and reporting of genetic disorders in clinical settings. And so the objectives of the meeting um, included, there were three objectives, and those were one, to define the current stat status of uh, genomic-based clinical informatics uh, and related knowledge gaps, uh, determine the facilitators and barriers that affect the development and deployment of genetic-based clinical informatics tools and resources, and also what research is needed to address them. And finally, the, uh, we wanted to, as an objective, identify resources needed to improve how these tools and resources are, are being developed and this impact on patient and clinical decision-making processes. Uh, we actually started uh, for the actual meeting. There was, uh, we start out with having Dr. Eric Green, who actually kicked off the meeting by giving a presentation about over the published strategic vision for improving uh, human health at the forefront of genomics, uh, which also highlighted the future research priorities and opportunities in human genomics that are relevant to NHGRI's mission. After that, we went into six sessions uh, that are described here to cover the uh, objectives and goals of the meeting. Um, and so these, these sessions covered a broad range related to clinical genomics informatics tools, um, anywhere from advancement technology to making the case for genomics uh, informatics tools, um, actually identifying from this stakeholders perspective also, in, in addition to the developers and the patients, um, identifying research agenda that addresses the process for developing these tools, and also understanding how these tools could be uh, developed and research could be done and using genomics when it's in a fragmented healthcare environment. And also uh, we did a actual assessment um, uh, led by Dr. Uh, Mark Williams and myself to actually understand uh, out of these five sessions, what really is the best ideas for developing a genomic based informatics research strategy. So the highlights from session one, in the case, making the case for a clinical genomics informatics research strategy, those included identifying elements from the survey. Uh, this was a uh, technical desiderata survey that was actually done twice, and I'll describe that later. Uh, the highlight where significant progress had been made and which ones still required additional research support. We also highlighted that there was a need to ensure that the development and implementation of these tools and resources is done in a manner that includes an equitable representation from diverse and underserved populations while we'll also making sure that reporting outcomes from these, from these tools and resources actually, uh, that they're able to capture data regarding both its benefits and harms in their clinical decision support use to improve mitigation, improve mitigation approaches. In regards to the survey, uh, actually we did a survey that actually uh, listed elements that came from the Techno Desirata for the in Integration of Genomic Data and Clinical Decision Support, which is a paper that was published in 2014. And also elements that were from the technical data for integration of genomic data into electronic health records that was published in 2012. And those elements are listed on the far right here. This survey was actually given twice. It was given in the genomic medicine seventh uh, seventh, uh, seventh meeting that was in 2014, and also in the genomic medicine 13 meeting. But these are different. Um, groups that actually filled out these uh, surveys. And these surveys weren't designed that we would come back to them years later and do them again. It just happened to fall in that we had these surveys. We said, well, let's combine, Mark and I thought, let's combine these two and see if there's things that actually changed between the 2014 meeting and the 2021 meeting. 
And so what I want you to take from here is that there was clearly that there are some areas that still had the same level of ranking between the two, which is the ones highlighted that in the columns that are in, um, on the, in the cells that are in white, uh, such as CD knowledge must have potential to incorporate multiple genes and clinical information. Uh, CDS knowledge must also, and that's clinical decision support knowledge, must also have the capacity to support multiple EHR platforms with various data and representation at minimum modifications. And also access to and transmit only genomics information is necessary with clinical decision support. While there's also uh, other opportunities, other thing, elements that we've actually made significant progress in, at least based off of the survey that was filled out by the members of the two, members of the Genome you know, 13 group, um, which is highlighted in blue. And there's still areas that we still need to have work on, which is also highlighted in the yellow uh, cells um, on this element. So what it shows is that in areas we have made progress in, but there's still um, some, still a lot of er opportunities related to addressing these elements that we still need to focus on. And when we look at session two, uh, the need for research to advance in advanced technology to support genomic medicine. The highlights that came from that discussion and presentations were to invest in research that advances a patient-centered approach and development and implementation of artificial and technologies. Uh, we also need to look at how the research that's being conducted by the genomic community should complement efforts in the private sector. So we don't want this to be done in isolation or in solace. We really realized, we understood that there's a need for us to work with our with the colleagues in the private sector to, to actually help, uh, help address this effort. Um, and that they shouldn't be done um, in separate in separate uh, environments. That they're and finally we also understand that support for research that generates outcomes can be used to inform both the business model of artificial intelligence and a matter that promotes open source development and attracts a broad range of stakeholders. Um, what we realized also is that you know when you're thinking about developing these different tools and resources, it's not just for research sectors. You also have to think about the business model. How do you encourage uh, private sector investments and support to do collaborations to actually uh, address this. And so you have to think about the business model when you're when you're putting something like this together. Um, and this is not just for the, the private sector, but it's also for the patients and the clinicians also. Um, when it comes from session three, we really, the highlights that came from that session was really about um, um, the revolving research to the stakeholders perspective, which is really focused on the enablers and barriers that affect the integration of genome-based clinical informatics resources in the healthcare system. Uh, these include research efforts that should incentivize collaborations in both the development and really all scopes of, of, of developing a learned healthcare system for genomics. Um, in addition, these tools and resources should also incorporate an educational and policy research component, component that focus on reducing barriers and improving knowledge for patients and providers. So it shouldn't just be focused on just the clinician side. You really have to bring the other half of that equation together, which is really the patients, um, and have them also be engaged in, in developing and understanding how they can use these inf the information uh, for their own care. Um, research should also focus on the development, implementation, and maintenance of genome-based workflows that, uh, as highlighted here, that also diminish the burden for primary care providers, um, that tap into other healthcare workers and engage patients, um, support innovation that's beyond typical clinical dis decision support reliance on alerts and reminders. So you can see here again that there's a running theme that you have to be more encompassing as far as the groups that you want to reach out to in order to uh, encourage the development and implementation of genomic based uh, clinical max tools and resources. That this really can't be focused on just one particular group. We really have to have a broader way of uh, broader engagement. Um, from four, from session four, which is defining the research agenda that addresses the process of developing genomic-based uh, clinical informatics tools and resources. We understand standards are important. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that we understand that that's a key part, that's another key part that has to be addressed. And it's not just standards, but actually having standards that could be broadly implemented and broadly uh, utilized. And so we want to improve, make, want to have research and, and have to better understand how to improve the interfaces between EHRs, uh, health level sevens, and fast healthcare interoperability resources, such as FHIR, um, and laboratory information systems, uh, which, and really help them understand more about how we can let those, have those standards work with limb systems. We also want to lower the regulatory barriers for the development and implementation of these tools and resources that are done so without compromising patient safety. Uh, we all understand that, that the complexity of trying to get through the regulatory process for some of these tools, but really in the research area, we can actually have an opportunity to help build these, to build the, the preliminary data that can help guide those, those uh, regulatory uh, and help net those regulatory processes. In addition, we want to develop and implement common semantic frameworks and data models that reduce reliance on manual curation. 
one thing we realized that where we can automate these opportunities, automate these tools and resources that we really want to, but we also understand there's a lot of effort that has to go into understanding what kind of what automation means in this case and how they should be done in a way that is not, that is consistent across the heterogeneous uh, healthcare system. From session five, uh, genomics in the fragmented healthcare environment, the highlights from this were really a need to invest in developing the specific use cases that support genomic medicine implementation through informatics, while also demonstrating value and scalability for genetic interoperability. In addition, we want to invest in research that focuses on establishing a genomic-based health exchange system in a manner that synergizes with the broader health IT community efforts in this space, while also supporting efforts that facilitate these tools and resources in the last mile of clinical implementation in the healthcare systems by identifying what has been developed and supporting implementation science research. Um, session six, I mentioned before, this is one where uh, Dr. Mark Williams and I really led. It's really a summary overall of what we, what from the feedback that we received from the previous sessions and what you know we could really focus on as far as highlights and understanding what in terms of uh, having these tools and resources, developing a research agenda for these tools and resources. And these really include incorporating an implementation component within the overall scientific framework work. Also engage in multi-level stakeholders for a balanced value proposition and broad support. Identify ways to reduce regulatory process barriers to stimulate growth in this field while also developing research methods to identify and mitigate inherent and pervasive bias in data, information systems and access knowledge and clinical algorithms and care delivery that interfere with the meaningful and beneficial use of genomics and clinical care. Um, and address the importance of implementation equity in low resource settings to ensure broad genomic clinical medicine does not exasperate health disparities. Again, you hear there's a running theme in all this is that we cannot do this by ourselves, but we really need to build support for groups to help us with this effort. Um, we also see, again, study human factors and unit interfaces and workflows that enable scalable, shareable, computable interferences for inferences for genomic knowledge and, and harmonization. While also ensuring clinical decision support incorporates information from multiple genes and clinical data. Uh, developing models that support sustainability, and again, creating education policies that bring gr more groups together and understand how to use their genomic information, while also advancing the interface between human cognition and information technology, um, and developing a method to reuse genetic data as patients move through the health move their healthcare systems in life. Uh, this is what highlighted what Dr. Williams mentioned before about how the need that you're going to have this genomic information uh, for more than just one time, and you should have some place someplace in a way to access this. Uh, the outcomes from this meeting were actually uh, very, were actually, I, I was very excited about. One of the uh, outcomes from this meeting was the fact that we were able to publish this, the findings from this meeting on the Journal of American Medical Informatics Association, uh, which is shown here on the left. In addition, and Terry highlighted this, that there was a notice of special interest that was actually published uh, earlier this year uh, that actually indicates NHGRI's interest in addressing critical gaps in genomic medicine regarding the availability of clinical max tools to facilitate patients' understanding of genomic information in a way that consists in their ability to navigate their and help them inform their healthcare decisions. Um, finally, there is, a, there is the uh, NHGRI Genomic Data Science Analysis Visualization Informatics Lab Space, uh, which we've actually added another uh, uh, RFA to, to actually promote the use of adding clinical components to the ANVIL to help uh, allow the let help the clinical researchers level the existing animal ecosystem to provide a suite of interoperable clinical components to assist the basic and clinical genomics research community. Um, I wanted, there's a lot of people I have to thank for this. This was not, again, this was as the theme here that we didn't do this in silo. Uh, we really worked with a lot of group of people to help make this possible. So the speakers that are highlighted here were a tremendous help with this. And as long as the co-moderators are listed here, I also wanna make a very specific um, acknowledgement to the names in blue. See, this meeting didn't start just with the genomic medicine work. This was actually planned uh, years before with the groups and names highlighted here in blue. We really came together to try to understand how we could use clinical informatics to and understand what a research a research strategy could look for clinical informatics. And we actually were able to work uh, work with the genomic medicine working group members to help make this possible. And Mark Williams was a great asset in helping us to bridge those gaps and help us understand how we can make this, this workshop possible. And I, he did a great job as my co-lead for this. Um, and in addition, names in, in orange here were the GS Genomic Medicine Workgroup members and the rest of the Genomic Medicine Workgroup members, members here also helped significantly help them make this workshop possible. And I also wanna thank the Duke Center of Applied Genomics and Precision Medicine, as well as the program analysts who made this possible along with the NHRI Office of Communications who let us have this virtual meeting run successfully. And of course, always the Genomic Mess 13 invitees. And that's it. Standing. 
I don't see hands or clarifying questions. Uh, if that's the case, then I think we can move on. Our next speaker is, is Travis Osterman, who's director of the uh, Cancer Clinical Informatics at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. Uh, Travis. Thanks, Christopher. Let me share my screen here. So I want to start by thanking the meeting organizers uh, for the opportunity to come here and talk. Um, my name is Travis Osterman. I'm a medical oncologist here at Vanderbilt and lead our clinical genomics uh, work stream. Uh, largely, I'm going to focus on integrating clinical genomic results into the electronic health record. This will be largely a pragmatic uh, discussion. This is actual work that's, that's really happening. I'm um, starting by listing disclosures. The only one that's probably important here is I have received no financial compensation from Epic, who happens to be our electronic health record. I'll talk about them throughout this talk, though, because we do use them as our EHR vendor. So when I talk about precision medicine with our executives internally and externally, I like to focus um, on this quote uh, from the National Academy's report from uh, 2011. I think we're all unified in this direction, which is consider a world where clinical information, including molecular features, support precise diagnosis and individualized treatment. For this meeting, though, I, I uh, want to go back to the 2015 uh, report, and Ken already did a fantastic job of summarizing this, and so I want to hone in on uh, two specific quotes uh, from recommendations coming out of that workshop. And, uh, and Christopher, I, I didn't realize that one of them was going to come from you. I didn't know you were going to be moderating this when I created the slides. But first is establishing data standards and common ways of representing outcomes uh, that would facilitate the scalability and efforts and the translation of genomic information into clinical care. And the second is integrating genomic data into the clinic through clinical decision support so the guidance is scalable and inter interoperable. So I want to really give an update on where I see the current state of the field, again, on that last piece, the translational actual operation piece that provides patient care. And really, the, the kudos here go to the HL7 Clinical Genomics Working Group. And so for those of you that, that aren't familiar, and uh, Bob, I think this is, was one of your questions that you dropped in, in QA, this has been the evolving data standard for transmitting clinical genomics information. That includes pharmacogenomics, somatic, and, uh, and germline information. The standard for trial use one or STU1 was initially published by this group in uh, November of 2018. The first implementation, uh, meaning end-to-end, -end, both the electronic health record implementation along with a reference lab implementation, making that connection and utilizing this as a data transmission standard, I think was described by Rush at uh, Epic's user group meeting in August of 2019. So at that point, to my knowledge, there was only one organization leveraging this um, in the entire country. Um, but how far we've come. So STU2 was officially released, or standard for trial use 2 was released in April of last year. And currently this month, this is still up to date as of August, there are 29 healthcare systems that are utilizing this data transmission standard to connect to reference laboratories and receive structured information. Um, this, I think, largely goes without saying, but I include this slide in almost all of my talks to our executive leaders because it's easy for us to get pigeonholed and to think about genomics or genetics just in one space. The program that I'm going to, going to describe encompasses germline testing, pharmacogenomic testing, and somatic testing. Um, and, and so uh, I'll use that to structure the rest of my talk. So our, our tagline at Vanderbilt is making healthcare personal. And uh, a part of us re-examining our efforts in precision medicine led to this clinical genomics work stream, which as I said, I, I helped to lead many of these efforts were already ongoing and it was bringing them together so we could leverage scale, understand what each of our, uh, we jokingly call silos of excellence uh, we're doing and uh, make that work across our enterprise. When we're thinking about clinical decision support, which has been a, a big topic here in, in the genomic space, largely this is, I think, what most of us think. We're either recommending genomic testing or we're personalizing care for an individual patient. So we've got a, a small table here, and I would say that's probably true for what we did um, from 2010 to at least through 2020. And like most programs, we have a, a robust pharmacogenomic uh, program. It's PREDICT here at Vanderbilt. It's, it's been discussed um, at length. We started that program in 2010 and currently have almost 20 drug gene interactions that we track. And so we're both recommending that test in our electronic health record and then able to integrate those results um, to help make sure that uh, the right patients are getting the right drugs at the right time. Um, and so again, this is, I think, um, not necessarily a, a new phenomenon, but we're trying to expand those same principles into other spaces. So for instance, this is uh, Adam Wright and, and Kevin S., a couple of uh, my colleagues. Adam is in the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Kevin is a pediatric neurologist. Um, 
we were talking with Kevin and he shared that about 40% of pediatric seizure disorders are due to genetic factors. The ones that aren't potentially have an anatomic cause and therefore can go to surgery and, and potentially have a really good outcome. And from his standpoint in pediatric EEGs, there were specific phrases that could be listed in those EEGs that made him think that this was less likely an anatomic cause of epilepsy and more likely an, a genomic or genetic uh, cause of epilepsy. And so we worked with him to, in real time, read those EEGs as they come off of the system and then alert providers who are reading those, uh, getting those results that uh, specific patients may actually need uh, genetic testing to identify a genetic cause of their seizure disorder. Um, and so this is live in our system and uh, is, I think, one of the ways that we're trying to push forward in spaces that are outside of pharmacogenomics as well. We've had several other examples, but uh, needless to say, uh, routinely for the last uh, many years, we've been uh, doing both recommending genomic testing and personalizing care for individual patients. But I think we need to do more. Um, we need to think not just about individual patients. We need to think about how we do this for patient populations. And we've already talked a little bit about patient health or population health. And I think we'll hear more about that uh, in, in, the next, uh, in the next session. But for me, this just adds another column to our table. So we need to think about how we recommend genetic testing or genomic testing to patient populations. And then how do we care for and deliver care to the entire population uh, to personalize their care? And I would argue that this is the direction we need to go. The easiest box to to fix is probably the upper left hand. We need to work our way down into the lower right hand box. To do this, we need to get the data out of the PDFs. I know that's a controversial statement, um, but uh, this is our genomic data strategy at Vanderbilt. It looks very simple, but it took quite a bit of time to get us all to agree on one strategy. Um, largely because when I went to talk to our, uh, our molecular pathologist and I said genomic data, they heard BAM, SAM, VCF files. Um, when I talked to my medical oncology colleagues, all they wanted were the final call variants on the report. Um, and so this became our strategy. We want to receive all of those discrete final results, just like any other internal lab that we would order, a CBC or CMP. We want to order it and receive it just like that. We want it to flow downstream into the electronic health record and then ultimately both provide patient care and then support our research enterprise. On the right-hand side, we don't want to give up all of those raw and processed files, whether that's from our internal genomics lab or whether that's from an external partner. We want to receive those. Those are going to go into an operational data storage and still may provide patient care because, again, we have an internal lab that may leverage those upstream files, and those are going to go into a research repository, but at least it gave us a, a place to level set. So we went live on what Epic calls the genomics module, which just is the way for us to receive those structured results from third-party um, reference laboratories in July of uh, 2021, and so we've been live just over a year now. Uh, it works exactly like you think it would. I put it, an order in the system, uh, just like any other order that's transmitted electronically to a reference laboratory, and the results come back to me in the electronic health record, just like a CBC. Uh, the area of medical oncology that I treat is thoracic malignancies, so I order a lot of these somatic tests. We were not first. As I said, Rush was the first to describe this. There are currently 39, or sorry, 29 groups um, but I put this list of, of logos up largely to show that what we're seeing is not an uptake across uh, just academic institutions. We're seeing a broad uptake across healthcare systems that are interested in getting these data out of PDFs and structured in their system. But the real value isn't me receiving those genetic results in my in basket into our electronic health record. The real value is how this benefits all of our downstream processes. So the order goes out and the variant data come back into, uh, into EPIC's database, which is called Chronicles. Because it's in our electronic health record, it's immediately available to patients. And we've already talked about putting patients at the center of this. So that means if I have a test here and I order it on one of my patients, those patients can then take that test and show it to another provider, regardless of what electronic health record they're using, because they'll have those data on their phone. One step down from that, this is a piece that many of my colleagues really enjoy, we're able to leverage some of the tools within our electronic health record to do queries that we would otherwise need to do with um, one of our uh, business intelligence tools. And so here, I'm using a tool that's built into Epic, again, just to do a, a quick search for KRAS alterations. And because I'm doing this within our electronic health record, I can find not only the patients with those alterations, but I can find out who their oncologist is, and I can find out when they're going to come back and see us. And similarly, our electronic health record has the ability to do some uh, kind of rudimentary data visualizations through a tool called Slicer Dicer. And because these are structured data, again, um, those work uh, right out of the box and all of my colleagues can access those data as well. 
And then finally at the bottom, because these are structured data flowing through all of our database systems, they also flow downstream to our research systems, which we have the uh, something called a research derivative, which is a copy of our electronic health record used for research. And then that is de-identified in something called the synthetic derivative, uh, which then is linked up to our biobank bioview. And so by putting these data in structured form, not only are we supporting patient care, but these data flow all the way downstream. But how do we get to that lower right box? And so Ben Park is, is seen here in the lower right. He's our cancer center director at Vanderbilt. Um, ben and I worked on a project called PROMPT, and it's a clever acronym that I can never remember what it stands for. But before we implemented these structured data, we basically had a, a team of data scientists that when a new first-in-class drug became approved for cancer treatment, that we had data scientists that would query multiple vendor systems. They would take that query and they would look against our electronic health record system to see which of those patients were still living, who their oncologists were. And then they would give us a report on which patients would potentially benefit from these new treatments after their FDA approval. This process took about one to two weeks, but we thought it was high value. And so uh, we, we absolutely supported that. Um, and for, for those of you that aren't in the somatic space as much, um, again, I treat primarily lung cancers and we have 22 approved drugs uh, with targeted variants, and that number continues to grow every year. Now, since we've moved to receiving structured data, this process is much, much shorter. When we know that there's a new first-in-class drug approved, the clinical team can do these queries directly within Epic, and uh, I'll just take you through that. Um, the process, one to two hours is even probably generous. Um, I'm not going to go through the screenshots, but needless to say, uh, you get five clicks to get to the report, and then the report looks like this. So I want to find a gene. The gene is KRAS, and I want to find uh, that it's present and that the significance is pathologic. I want to make sure the patient's alive. And then importantly for this example, which is uh, the sotorasinib example, this is a drug that specifically only works for the amino acid change D12C. And so I can also call out that I need that specific amino acid change. And then I just click run. And I've redacted this entire report, which makes it not super exciting on a slide. But what we get is we get 57 patients. And so this simple report, which again, I can run from clinic, shows me 57 patients, but it also shows me their care team, which means who is their oncology team. And we can send that out uh, the same day that an FDA approval comes around. And we're looking forward to leveraging these kinds of uh, reports for other population management tools as well. So I said that we went live in 2021. But we, like others, have been doing testing for a very long time. And so we went back and took all of the old XML and JSON and any other semi-structured format that we could find from any vendor, and we did a, a backload. Um, so we took all of those data and did a, a tedious mapping from the uh, vendor proprietary format into uh, the genomics module standard, which is largely based on that HL7 clinical genomics standard. Um, and so we backloaded uh, earlier this summer 12,000 results and currently have uh, 16,000 results that are structured in our health record, which we think is the largest in the country. So how did we do that? We went all the way back. This is a, a test that was an internal, very, very small panel around 2011. Uh, as our melanoma panel, it just tested for uh, BRAF uh, B600E. Uh, clearly, that doesn't go into the into the electronic health record. There was no HL7 for that. Um, but we could map those results and then create our own HL7 messages. And then basically it looks to the system like we're our own reference laboratory. It's important if you're gonna do these kinds of uh, projects that you turn off all of the alerting. We, don't want, we didn't want our providers to get erroneous messages from results that were 10 plus years old. We also didn't wanna alert the patients. Um, and then uh, one of the things we learned is uh, we also uh, requested a bunch of labs to be scheduled. Um, and so we were able to, to stop that pretty quickly. But this also works for more complex testing. And so this, these are examples from foundation medicine. So this process really handles also variant data fusions, germline versus tumor, if you're calling that out, MSI, TMB, et cetera. And the goal is just to do a one-to-one -one mapping from the previous data standard into this EPIC data standard, um, which again, largely is based on the clinical genomics working group open data standard. It creates an HL7 message that is in that HL7 format. And then we can fire that against our, our interface to ingest data. And so not only going forward, but also you can think about going backward to take all those data and leverage them uh, as well. And so how do I think we're doing? Well, for the first one, as far as establishing data standards, certainly not my work, but through the work of HL7, I think we've made tremendous progress there. And second, integrating clinical decision support. I think we're pushing the envelope. I think there's opportunities to do this even at the population level today. So what are the next summits? What do we have to tackle next? 
and largely, I think the things that I had here were already brought up. I think that um, Rex brought up this concept uh, earlier uh, about providing the standard way for patients to provide and transfer genetic and genomic information. I think that's certainly going to be key going forward. Um, Casey brought up the idea of, of really putting these data in the hands of the patients. I couldn't agree more. I'll take it one step further and say that patients are going to be consenting for large consortium studies and healthcare systems are going to then be asked to share those data with, um, with that uh, research consortium. And we need to figure out ways to do that. Uh, Mark brought up again, uh, the idea that once you test someone's whole exome or whole genome, you shouldn't have to run that again. You may need to re rerun the, the bioinformatics pipeline. And certainly internally, we've thought a lot about reanalysis and, uh, and the role for reanalysis. And then finally, I think education is going to be key for both physicians and, and nurses. This has been a, a huge effort uh, at our organization and everyone pictured here has, has been involved. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to come and talk today. And, and this is my email address if anyone has questions. It's outstanding. I do see one question, but I think we should defer it until the John from Jonathan Berg uh, until the discussion, if that's acceptable. It's not really a clarification question in my mind. Um, so our uh, last uh, but not least speaker is uh, Gail Herme del Fro, uh, who is professor and vice chair for research at the Department of Biomedical Informatics at the University of Utah. Gail Herme, please. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me share my slides. Uh, can everyone hear me and see the slides? Yes, we can. All right. So I will talk about a project that uh, has been funded by two grants from the National Cancer Institute. One of them focused on uh, a, enabling a, a software platform for a population level uh, genomic clinical decision support. And the other one is a, a randomized trial, multi-site trial um, using this platform uh, for a specific use case. So the, the idea here is, uh, I think it aligns with uh, some of uh, what the previous speakers mentioned in terms of uh, taking clinical genomics to the population uh, level uh, instead of, uh, or in addition to um, point of care uh, clinical settings. So the original motiv motivation for this uh, uh, project was, um, the finding that about 13% of individuals are at elevated risk for familial breast and colorectal cancer. Most of these uh, individuals are unaware of their risk. And at the same time, there are um, evidence-based guidelines recommending genetic testing based on their uh, family history. And these uh, are the three main sources of, of guidelines for that. So the goals of the project were um, essentially to enable a population health management platform that allows us through uh, you know, computable logic, identify patients who meet evidence-based criteria for genetic testing, and then uh, use a registry-based approach with uh, uh, patient outreach tools to manage uh, the risk. Um, we leverage family history that's available in the EHR and uh, we do not try to collect or improve the collection of family history. We essentially try to use what's available. Uh, another essential part of the strategy is to minimize primary care effort. Pr uh, primary care providers are kept into the loop of this whole process, uh, but uh, they are not asked to uh, basically do uh, anything in the process. Um, in terms of patient outreach, Part of the innovation is to try to use automated, uh, let me go back here, uh, chatbots uh, for, for this patient outreach process, which includes patient education um, and, and offering of genetic testing. Now I'll talk about this more in a minute. Uh, and third, uh, again, we are supporting the BRIDGE trial, which is about to finish enrollment uh, at University of Utah and NYU, and that's funded by the Cancer Moonshot Program. Um, for those of you who would like to read more details about the platform and its architecture, we called it GARD. This has been published in Jamia uh, earlier this year, and I'll uh, give you, uh, uh, you an overview, just getting a little more technical, but uh, at a very high level. Uh, I'm going to talk about the data flow. So everything starts, we have here on the left side, uh, the OpenCDS 
platform, which is an open source uh, clinical decision support web service that can be executed uh, agnostically from any electronic health record system. Uh, in the middle, we have a population coordinator that uh, executes uh, a number of tasks. And on the right side, you have uh, an EHR system. In our case, uh, we worked with uh, EPIC at University of Utah and NYU, and also Cerner at Intermountain Healthcare. So first step here, the population coordinator identifies a screening population, which could be a, a broad net. In our case, it's basically everyone uh, who meets a certain age range and have been seen in a primary care at uh, University of Utah or uh, NYU. Um, the population coordinator um, retrieves, let me go back here, uh, data from these patients and um, transforms everything into fire uh, from the EHR. Next, um, fire data is transmitted to OpenCDS in bulk. So we're running everything at the population level. And uh, OpenCDS has an interface based on the CDS hook standard, which is in a nutshell, a clinical decision support services standard that allows uh, an independent service to receive a request uh, to analyze patients and according to certain logic, um, and then respond with the results of those analyses all in a standard format. And CDS Hooks uses FHIR as the data standard, both for uh, requests and also the responses. Um, again, everything is done in bulk for uh, optimization of performance. The results are go back. In, uh, in our case, we, we are running uh, NCCN guidelines for uh, based on uh, family history for um, cancer. And uh, the results are then exported back into the EHR. In our case for EPIC, it uses EPIC's uh, population registry solution. Um, so we load patients who meet criteria into the registry, and then uh, the genetic counseling assistants use that registry functionality to manage the population and conduct uh, patient outreach activities. This is uh, just a, a, a brief example of the logic that has been implemented. This, this is for breast cancer. We also implemented for colorectal uh, cancer. Uh, it's just an excerpt, just to give you an idea of what's behind the scenes. Um, um, this is probably kind of outdated right now and it's oversimplified. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot more logic uh, under the covers. And this is a screenshot of how the registry uh, dashboard looks like in uh, EPIC. Uh, we see a list of patients in the population. That's number one. Number two, the ability to filter patients according to any kind of criteria. For example, you can filter by clinic and work uh, on patients that are uh, assigned to a specific clinic or a specific provider. Uh, number three, you can track the outreach status of uh, specific patients. So you can see uh, for a list of patients who has not received any outreach message yet or what patients responded, et cetera. And then last, uh, number four, for uh, you select a patient, you can drill down, general counseling assistants can look at specific data points that are relevant to the outreach uh, and management process. Like I said, uh, this platform is supporting the bridge trial, which is basically comparing two approaches for patient outreach, education and outreach uh, with the goal of offering genetic testing for patients who meet family history-based criteria. And um, the two arms of the study are usual care, which basically involves a genetic counseling assistant making phone calls to those patients one by one, uh, providing a, a, some education over the phone and trying to schedule a genetic counseling appointment. So it's very involved, uh, eff effortful. The alternative approach in the second arm is using an automated chatbot where uh, the chatbot provides uh, education about genetics and um, and then at the very end of a chatbot conversation, it offers uh, the, uh, the option to receive genetic testing. And I'll talk a little more uh, about that in a minute. So this is the workflow for the standard usual care outreach. So we, again, we run our 
population-based algorithm using GARD um, based on data that's available in the HR. Patients who meet NCCN criteria for breast, ovarian, or colorectal cancer are added to the registry. Um, generic counseling assistant does patient outreach uh, through the patient portal and uh, phone calls, and they try to set up a generic counseling appointment. At the end of this whole process, um, general counselors uh, write a note in the HR, they copy the primary care providers in the note with uh, recommendations, and they may add uh, findings to the patient's problem list. That's usual care. The alternative workflow, uh, we have two chatbots here, a pre-test chatbot where, again, we run the same uh, population-based algorithm. Uh, patients are added to the registry, but this time, instead of calling patients, patients receive a message through the patient portal with a link to a chatbot. They launch the chatbot, um, interact with the chatbot, and at the end, they are offered uh, an option to test. Uh, if they decide to uh, do testing, they receive a, a kit on the mail, collect the sample at home, mail the sample back to the lab, and um, an outreach note is uh, written back into EPIC uh, with the patient's decision and the transcript of that conversation. There's also a post-test uh, chatbot. Once the results are received, uh, general counseling assistant reviews the results for patients who test negative. Um, they receive another message in the portal with a chatbot link, go through a, a different chatbot that explains the, the implications of that negative result. And um, then for patients who test positive or VUS, then you have a, a, a genetic counseling appointment. We're, we're basically back to usual care workflow. But most patients test negative and are uh, managed in, in an automated fashion using uh, the chatbot. Here again, in both cases, uh, a note is written into the HR the, uh, with clinical recommendations for the post, uh, the patients who test negative, that's an automated note. And uh, for patients who test positive of US, then the note is written by general counselor. So a little bit about the chatbot, what it covers. Uh, these are the, the, the main topics that the chatbot goes through. And I'm just gonna go over uh, an animation here that shows how it works. You click on the link, that's a, a patient portal message. Uh, it launches the chatbot. You see that it builds uh, item by item so the patients can control the pace of the conversation. They can keep going. Uh, I, here, I can ask for more information. If I would like more details, I'll click tell me more. If I'm satisfied with the content and understand, uh, uh, I'll just click got it, got it and move on. Um, and then I'm gonna walk through here. At the very end, uh, it's offering, um, would you like to test? I could say yes, no, I'm not sure yet. If I click, I'm not sure yet, the general counseling assistant will give a call and uh, address any concerns or uh, questions. This is a paper about a pilot with seven uh, participants that uh, preceded the trial and showing a, a few interesting findings. We looked in detail how patients interacted with the chatbots. We found that 70% of people who completed the chatbot agreed with testing. And interestingly, the chatbot allows uh, free text questions and, and answers uh, matches with answers in a question bank, uh, question and answer bank, but they rarely use that functionality. So uh, it seems like the, the script in the chatbot had broad enough coverage that uh, patients uh, didn't really need to ask uh, open-ended questions. Okay, so this is gonna show a little bit of, uh, on, on the bridge trial and some preliminary results. Um, we ran the algorithm against 445,000 patients at University of Utah Health and uh, NYU. About 5% of the patients met NCCN criteria across the two sites. And a random sample was extracted from those. And then patients were split into one of the two study arms. Uh, the, like I said, the trial is about 
enrollment has been completed at the University of Utah. It's about to uh, complete at NYU. So far, we have over 3,000 patients who received outreach in the one of the two study arms. Um, I'm not going to make comparisons here because the trial hasn't been uh, completed yet. And um, so we're just looking at overall, you know, PRISMA kind of numbers. Um, the 23% of the people who received an offer to use the chatbot or received a phone call for genetic counseling completed the entire process. So either they completed the chatbot interaction or they uh, scheduled a genetic counseling appointment and, and had that appointment completed. Of those patients, 65% had genetic testing ordered, agreed to, to do genetic testing. And, um, 5% of those who tested, tested positive for a pathogenic variant. 50% um, were negative, 44% uh, found a VUS, and uh, we still have 88% of those uh, patients with results pending. Some uh, lessons learned in this uh, whole process, uh, we found chatbots does seem to be a scalable uh, approach for patient outreach man, uh, engagement. It really manage, uh, minimizes um, genetic counseling uh, efforts. Data availability, family history, um, we all know it's, it's incomplete, inaccurate in the HR, but when you have a family his history assertion in the HR, we found that it, it's largely correct. Rarely those lead to false positive uh, patient identification. The clinical workflow, as we, we mentioned, that we barely touch primary care in this uh, approach. Uh, we tested interoperability at two um, e EHR systems at three institutions. We At Intermountain Healthcare, we demonstrated that this works with the Cerner system, uh, but we found health disparities. Uh, there are significant disparities in family history documentation across um, different uh, patient populations. Uh, there's gender disparities, et ethnicity, uh, disparities and also low socioeconomic status. A problem with the chatbot, it, it re relies on smartphone technology, and we know that 25% um, of the people in low SES and rural populations don't have a smartphone. And we also know that our approach needs to be adapted for EHRs that are used in low resource settings. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, I apologize, my Zoom and computer both crashed, so I'm reduced to a laptop. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Guermé, I, 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 I did hear most of that, so that was excellent. Um, I believe I've lost my question thread because it was in chat, but Travis, I do believe Jonathan Berg had a question for you. If we may, in our discussion, oh, forgive me, were there clarifying questions for Guermé before we go on? I don't see any hands. If that's the case, let's go back, Jonathan, to your question to Travis. Uh, Travis, you've read it, so could you yeah, come? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to summarize. And so Jonathan asked in the data backload process, what kind of clinical validation did we think about? <clears throat> Which is a fantastic question. This is something I really championed at, at our organization. Um, as we did the mapping, there was certainly a chance that we would get something wrong. And so we loaded all of those messages into a test environment and then did a PDF versus load uh, comparison side by side. Um, we ended up, I think, doing that on about 15% of our data set and did not find any, um, any errors in that population. And so then felt comfortable proceeding with the, the rest of the load. Um, but that's, that was actually the probably the longest piece was getting those manually reviewed, which I guess was probably about 3,000 um, results, as I recall. Thank you. And uh, Bob Dole, and I recall you had a question about terminology. Do you, Travis said he would answer it in his presentation. Uh, did you have a follow-on to that, or did do you feel he addressed your question? Okay, well then, uh, then let's move on to the questions for Guilherme. Uh I see both Heidi Rem has a hand up and a, and a question in the chat. Heidi, please go ahead. Great, nice talk. Um, so my question to Guilherme is around, well, two questions. 
One is, it, it sounds like this was maybe a research study, so insurance coverage wasn't the issue, but do you anticipate that if you are have no involvement of a genetic counselor, like a human live one, would, ins would insurance companies not necessarily pay for the testing? That's my one question. And the other one is why are VUS is being returned in a screening context with one suspicion I have that is we're experiencing in our healthcare system is that insurance won't cover screening tests, but they will cover diagnostic tests. But if you order the diagnostic test, you get VUSs back. Whereas if, so, so it's like a practical issue for insurance coverage. So they, they sort of tie into each other. Yeah, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer these questions. Uh, I, I would hope our genetic counseling uh, uh, collaborator, Wendy Coleman, who's the director of the uh, genetic counseling program at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, would uh, be here. Uh, we do know that it is true that because it's uh, not only because it's a research project, but the Huntsman Cancer Institute, for patients who are uninsured at least, um, covers the, the, that kind of genetic testing uh, for free. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I am not sure what the implications are in terms of uh, since uh, there's no counseling pretest. Thanks. So, so I go ahead, please. Now, uh, Chris, you uh, since your Zoom crashed, you might not see all of the questions in the chat. I certainly do not. So, okay. Carol, please save uh, me. Yes. <laughs> so Jeff Ginsburg um, uh, is asking again about the chat bot if it's available in languages other than English uh, and how you handle uh, individuals who are not technology savvy or on the other side of the digital divide. Um, it's a multi-part question and any experience with chatbots and underrepresented yeah. populations? That's Yeah, great questions. Uh, the chatbot is offered in English and Spanish currently. And the also this, the message, the patient portal message that uh, suggests the patient to use the chat, but also uh, is link, language uh, specific. So if the uh, preferred language documented in the patient's EHR is Spanish, they'll receive uh, the messages in, in Spanish and use the chatbot in Spanish. Um, the chatbot is currently undergoing a cultural adaptation for patients, uh, 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 multiple ethnic backgrounds and also low socioeconomic status. Um, and we have a proposal uh, to a renewal proposal for our platform, the guard platform that involves adaptation to really address uh, health equities. Um, one of the major problems I mentioned in, in the talk is uh, we did an analysis of family history documentation and found substantial disparities, not only in family history documentation, but also in patient identification, um, you know, all over the place, all sorts of uh, different uh, categories of uh, patient populations uh, that um, basically, we don't know what the underlying factors are, but uh, the fact is that there's the, the documentation of family history much uh, more sparse for certain groups. So we are trying to use natural language processing, uh, partial matching criteria. For example, patients who do not have an, a, an age of onset documented in the family history, we would still match against NCCN criteria and then try to use other approaches to collect that information. For example, uh, use a chatbot to basically ask, do you know when your aunt had a uh, breast cancer or uh, use patient navigators for that. I, we need to use some more deliberate approaches to try to uh, reduce those gaps. So there's another question uh, about um, language preference measure for those who used or didn't use the chat bot. Did you see a difference in chat bot uptake depending on the primary language, I think is we the yeah, great question. We have not looked into uh, those outcomes yet. Uh, probably starting uh, within the next uh, month or so, once the trial enrollment is fully completed, then we can drill down into uh, those analyses. And and did you see a, uh, did you capture reasons? For, so there were 30% that didn't use the chat box. Did they give a reason for why, did you try to capture why they weren't interested in using yeah. the chat box? 
No, we, we do not capture, a, a, well, there's a survey at the end of the, the whole process, they're invited to complete a red cap survey and, and, and that asks questions about usability, satisfaction, and, and also reasons for testing or not testing. We have not analyzed those data yet, so stay tuned. And I think the last question that's specific uh, for you, is there a difference in the percentage of people who agreed to testing depending on whether they consented via the chat bot or the genetic counselor? That is the primary outcome of the trial. Yeah. And uh, we, ca we cannot analyze that data yet. Uh, again, hopefully within a month or so. I think, Chris, that takes care of all the questions I saw in the... Well, thank you. And I appreciate your saving me, Carol. No um, uh, I do see a question in the Q&A from Sandy uh, Aronson. Uh, this is for Travis. Uh, he uh, says, it's uh, awesome the way you loaded historical variant data. I had two questions. Would it be possible to provide a sense of the resources that were required yeah. to accomplish this? That's the first question. I'll let you answer that. Yes, Sandy, it's, it's a great question. Happy to address that. Um, you know, Internally, I joke that this was a labor of love. And so um, largely in the meetings, it was um, me and one of our data scientists who has been responsible almost, uh, almost completely by herself for doing all of our genomic queries for all of the vendor systems, for our internal systems. Whenever we did clinical trial feasibility, for instance, and we wanted to know how many patients might be able to enroll on a new clinical trial. Um, along with working with usually two representatives from our electronic health record. Um, that piece, uh, I think, was as much for their benefit as, as ours. They were very interested in basically testing the edges of their data model. And we had a really big sample that we were looking to push in. Um, and so I think that was mutually beneficial and hopefully helps things move forward for others going forward. Um, but I would say we probably did three hours per week of meetings for the better part of two months uh, just to do the column to column uh, piece. And then as I talked about before, the clinical validation was several months um, after we got it set up in our test environment, because it just takes a long time, as you know, to look at a PDF and then make sure that it was, it was uh, incorporated into the electronic health record correctly. Um, this, the, your second question about whole genome sequencing is um, who do you feel those variants uh, should be handled by. So the way the way we're organized here is we, we do have an internal um, whole whole genome sequencing group. Um, they do the sequence. We you can either order the whole genome or you can do a, a panel based test where we only release the panel results. But they're leveraging the uh, the variants in in BUSs from other tests as they're trying to call as our molecular pathology team is trying to call variants um, on our internal test. And so for us. That's largely driven by molecular pathology, but it, it still fits within our genomic data strategy of, again, trying to save as many of those upstream files as we can, because you don't know when your internal molecular pathology team might need those to inform the variant calling on the patient that's in front of them. It's a great question. Thank you, Travis. Um, our question pace is, is diminishing, but Ken, that was an outstanding summary uh, of what happened last year in the virtual summit. I guess the obvious question, uh, how the, many of the plans were, were how do we phrase this, um, uh, holistic and clear and desirable, but the obvious question is what kind of progress do you think was made on, on some of those, uh, particularly for the engagement of diversity uh, in, in, in education and patients and other uh, modalities. So in, in regards to NHRI, they've done a very, they're doing, they're actively engaged in trying to address this. I mean, you're starting to see funding opportunities come out that actually specifically highlight how you're going to engage diverse populations and the tools and resources that you're developing. You're seeing, uh, again, we have a new office that's been, that's, that's, been, that's been stood up that's actually addressing this very topic too. So you're seeing this, as actively NHRI actually being part of it. When across the other, now outside of NHRI and NIH, I mean, you're seeing other groups such as, you know, HL7, I mean, they're looking at how to incorporate this information. You're seeing standards groups, you're seeing 
these discussions that are happening and people are actually investing in developing these tools and resources to actually include diversity and inclusion of underserved populations in their in their capabilities. So I am seeing, I'm hopeful and I'm because of the evidence I'm seeing in this. Um, the truth, the other issues that we need, need to address is that, you know, how are we going to work amongst ourselves in collaborations to help facilitate a more standardized way of developing these tools so that they can be deployed in this heterogeneous environment uh, for that help, you know, diverse populations? Because right now everybody's doing their piecemeal approach. And you really need to start looking at this in terms of how can we collectively do this in a manner to address this need. So I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. No, that was very helpful indeed. Um, I see a hand from Mark Williams. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to add on to uh, what Ken said. First of all, in terms of, uh, you know, again, framing uh, GM13, it was really to try and set out a research agenda uh, for the field of informatics. And so I think this is really a critical uh, aspect that's going to have to be incorporated into uh, research. And I think the message that we need to be doing this uh, came across loud and clear. The other thing that was interesting to me is that it's not just that we don't have information about how um, uh, diversity um, is being impacted by the systems that we have. And there are plenty of publications that are showing that even things like clinical decision support algorithms and things like that inc incorporate inherent biases that you know lead to uh, differential performance, um, but we don't have methods really to uh, begin to dissect that. So we not only have a, a result deficit, but we have a methodologic deficit in terms of how we actually address this. And so uh, one of the other points that um, was a little deeper in the weeds, so Ken uh, didn't present it, is the idea that there are going to have to be new research methodologies, particularly in the informatics space, to try and get at these specific issues because there's so much that's just baked into our systems that we're having a hard time disentangling. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that uh, expansion. Uh, there was a question for Gil Herme in the uh, Q&A and I see Gil Herme is, is typing his answer, but why don't you tell us Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so the question is uh, whether there were any specific security requirements to use uh, open source CDS to identify patients. So the Guard platform, which is based, uh, it's an open source platform, uh, it um, had to go through security clearance, both at University of Utah and NYU. In terms of deployment, there are um, three options. One, at the University of Utah, we have it hosted internally inside the, our firewall. So we have a virtual machine that hosts the software. The data never leaves our institution and everything is run uh, internally. At NYU uses uh, cloud-based uh, solutions for their EHR. And I mean, they are really a cloud-based shop and they prefer to uh, deploy Guard into one of their cloud-based uh, servers. Um, however, um, the way the architecture works uh, is that Guard never touches any of the NYU software infrastructure, EHR infrastructure. Um, the identified data is sent in a flat file from NYU into Guard. Guard analyzes all that DNA identified data, sends the results back uh, to NYU, and then they re-identify uh, in um, write the results back into Epic. So that, that approach allows you to deploy this solution in a cloud-based uh, uh, way and um, address, somewhat addressing the security concerns of uh, you know, external software having direct access to uh, identified data within uh, an institution. Thank you, that's, that's extremely helpful. I see a hand from Terry Manolio. Yes, thanks, Chris. Um, Guillermo, you, you were talking about family history data and how they're incomplete and, and not randomly incomplete, but, uh, but incomplete in, in parallel, oftentimes with um, health disparities populations. But you also said that there, I think, um, that they may be sufficient in large numbers, which I, I sort of take to mean 
you can, you know, if, if you see something, it's probably real and it's probably useful. But maybe could you expand on that a little bit, what you meant by that point? Yeah, uh, so we can say that, I mean, there's been several studies looking at the quality of family history in the EHR, and we don't have full pedigrees on there by no means. Uh, that's uh, guaranteed. But for um, the analysis of evidence-based criteria such as NCCN, all you need is for the patient to meet one of the criteria uh, oh, to justify offering genetic testing. Uh, one example is uh, a patient who has uh, an aunt with uh, history of breast cancer with an early onset. Um, that's sufficient to meet um, uh, NCCN criteria. You don't need to know about all the other family members and other uh, cancers uh, for that. I see. No, that's that's very helpful, Guillermo. And I guess as as you know, a former medical student who was traumatized by by having to collect three generation you know family histories and pedigrees, um, I, I I think we we do ourselves a disservice by suggesting that that's the gold standard. And and I know within the Emerge Network, we looked at family inf history information early on, um, and only 20% of the medical records had any mention at all of any family history. Um, and I, you know, hopefully things have gotten better, but, but do you have any ideas about how we, I, and this is a toughie, lots of people have addressed it, but, but do you have, yeah. uh, successfully, but do you have any ideas or do others have ideas of how we can, we can possibly improve that? So I think we can say that things are getting, we, we have a paper on that, that's on JAMA as well, on uh, it's a qualitative a mixed method analysis of family history collection in primary care, where that's where a lot of the family history is collected. And uh, we found a few interesting patterns. One of them um, that seemed to, to cross uh, to other institutions as well. Uh, medical assistance seemed to be the main individuals collecting family history that's part of the standard workflow. Uh, they prioritize according to specific areas that are basically high priority and are available in the family history section of the EHR. So you have pre-populated drop downs and, and items that are easy to collect so they can easily go through those items. Um, it, you know, you as you expect, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer are all on there. Um, the other pattern we found was uh, an increased use, at least at our institution, it became kind of standard of care that patients uh, are asked to complete uh, pre-visit questionnaires in the patient portal, and those include uh, a short family history questionnaire. Um, those, uh, of course, we believe that this uh, helps exacerbate disparities because um, it's very likely patients who uh, have uh, better access to technology uh, will be more likely to complete the previous questionnaires and therefore have better family history documentation. So that's uh, uh, one of the issues. Um, we will analyze, that's one of the things we're planning to do is to see if there's a relationship between patients completing those previous questionnaires and actually being uh, identified later on. So uh, in that, so that might be one of the solutions. Try to promote the use of those pre-visit questionnaires more and make it easier to, those questionnaires easier to access for patients who do not have access to uh, broadband internet. Great, thank you. Thank you. And I see NICHD has commented on their initiatives to link parent-child uh, medical records um, uh, is noted in the chat. Uh, oh, Jeff, your hand is up, sorry. No, that's okay. Thanks. Um, great session. Uh, this question is mainly for Travis, but anybody could could jump in. First of all, I'm wondering whether any of your systems are returning genetic information directly to patients, whether that's an option, given the discussion we had in the last session. And the second question is really about establishing the clinical utility of return of results. And I'm wondering, um, and maybe you, you said this and I missed it, is, a, a, is there a systematic way to, to capture outcome data downstream of the decision support that's being given to the provider. So we know what's happening in behaviorally, uh, decisions that are made or not being made, and ultimately what the economic consequences of return of results might be. Yeah, no, both great questions and certainly um, things that, that we think about here. So institutionally, we 
are in favor of returning results immediately to patients when, when available. And so um, whether it's an internal result or external result for genetics or genomic testing, um, those results with very few exceptions are made immediately available to the patient in our patient portal um, at the exact same time that it comes to me. And what we've typically advised um, our clinicians is that uh, just to make sure you have that conversation with the patient, that they may receive the results before you have a chance to review them and just set the expectations accordingly. We have not found that that has had any negative, at least not as many uh, negative ramifications as I think many of us expected. So I've, I've certainly shifted my perspective on that. Um, and I think our patients generally appreciate having that information for exactly the same portability reasons that were brought up earlier. Um, and then the, the second question is really about clinical utility and how we measure the efficacy of clinical decision support. Um, we have a whole myriad of uh, dashboards that we use to see how often we're alerting clinicians. Um, the harder part is what action they take. And the challenge here is if the action is incorporated into the alert itself, it's pretty easy to track. But when we dive in to alerts that we think should have a, a high probability of changing physician behavior, um, and we find that they're just dismissed, if we actually look at the chart, not infrequently what happens is the alert is dismissed, but they actually take the action then outside of the alert. Mm -hmm. So we may recommend a different antiplatelet agent they choose yet a third antiplatelet agent. And so that shows up in our dashboard as a miss that they've dismissed this, but really the action was that they took the appropriate action. Um, so that continues to be a challenge for us. That's, that's a note we have not yet um, cracked. We also are most mature in this space with pharmacogenomics. And so um, even some of our, our guideline-based testing around um, patients with metastatic prostate cancer and getting those patients germline tested, we're still trying to develop dashboards to make sure that we follow those. But I, I think you do need an institutional strategy to do so. But if you dig in, you can at least get some data. The data may not be perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And maybe the last question from Mark Williams before Carol leads the wrap up. Yeah, I wanted to uh, um, reinforce uh, the point that Travis made about uh, the simultaneous release of information to patients and clinicians. When we initiated our MyCode return of results uh, over five years ago, we built in a delay, which was not consistent with our institutional standard of simultaneous release of lab imaging uh, data to patients and to clinicians, because we said, this is new. We really just don't know how it's going to uh, react. We want to be conservative. And so we... Um, um, had a clinician advisory committee meeting um, about two years ago, and the question was raised, how can we have this delay? Why aren't we releasing this information at the same time as uh, we release all of our other information? And we said, well, remember when we had initially talked about it, we thought that was a good idea. And they all looked around and they said, well, that was kind of dumb. Um, and so we now also release it um, simultaneously. And when we talk with our patients as part of our ongoing engagement, they say, hey, we hear bad news from you guys all the time, you know, whether it's an imaging study or a lab study or that, you know, we can handle it. So don't treat this as being exceptional. So I think uh, this is a really important point in terms of what our uh, level set should be in terms of the sensitivity of this information. I couldn't agree, Mark. We're, we're trying to get it to a place where genetic and genomic information is just like any other lab. Excellent. Thank you. Carol, uh, I appreciate your rescue earlier, and I'm asking you to do it again. Uh, if you would graciously uh, lead us through some wrap-up discussion, that would be helpful. Yes, sure. I, I actually, but I have, I think I have one more question that I'd like to hear the perspective of all the panelists on, and that is um, going back to the sort of the patient-centric aspect of this and how to deliver this information to to a patient. So Ken covered it as a topic that was part of the research agenda meeting. Um, and Travis, you, you mentioned it in passing that there's an interface that patients can use. And I'm, I'm really curious about each of your perspectives on how to go about building those interfaces that are going to be interpretable by patients. Like how do we go about actually building uh, an interface that a patient can log into and see the information and really grasp and, and understand what it is they're seeing. So I, maybe we can start with Ken and then just 
go to Travis and then you hear me. So from my perspective, I mean, this is happening already. You're seeing the private sector starting to develop these apps and companies are starting are being stood up to do this very thing. And for, so for me, it's not so much that about these tools being developed. It's more about making sure there's a consistent message being provided that patients can understand and work with the clinicians on. Um, in addition to that, I'm, we really don't have a choice but to move forward with those kinds of efforts because the information block and provision in the 21st Century Cures Act puts this other, other responsibility that we have to address as far as you know, providing these information to patients in a, in a reasonable time. I mean, there are certain exceptions to it. Um, but I think, again, this is something where on the research side is understanding what is the appropriate language and documentation that needs to be provided that could be consistently shared is what I think the focus should be on because these tools are being developed. Carol, I, I think that it sounds like we're all very aligned in this. I think that um, we can take a lot of uh, a lot of information from the open notes uh, efforts that patients are increasingly knowledgeable. I do think we have to be sensitive to health literacy, but I think we have to release the results immediately whenever possible to the patients. And then I think the next grand challenge is how do we support patients that are interested in investigating those things further? I think there are opportunities for centralized learning, et cetera. Um, our genetic counselors certainly know much more about that than, than I do. I don't think we'll ever be able to replace the personal interaction of a genetic counselor reviewing the report. Um, and so I think we need to decrease barriers and delays in, in getting patients uh, in touch with genetic counselors to help that with that interpretation. Um, but I'm certainly all for making the report results immediately available to patients and making those uh, results easily portable, meaning that those patients can take those results to another healthcare system, either by request or by transfer or to a research consortium if they wanna participate in all of us or, or another large project. Yeah, I think there's lots of opportunities for research in, in ways to better communicate results and educate patients about uh, what they mean. I mean, uh, potential ideas, I mean, in the chatbot space, uh, you could imagine any, any uh, genetic result could be coupled with uh, access to a chatbot that patients can access anytime. And um, there's some evidence outside genetics that uh, chatbots have advantages over static materials like handouts or uh, static web pages because patients control the pace and also the depth of the information. They can choose what topics to, to look at uh, uh, more in depth. And uh, also ideas like uh, transferring to a human uh, at some point, which could, you know, I don't understand this. Can I talk to someone? And a gender counselor, gender counseling assistant uh, could, could call. Um, yeah, I, I think there's lots of opportunity for, for research in this area, in, in, you know, in, in, the, in the realm of communication as well, how best, better ways to communicate that in, using these kinds of technologies. Great. Uh, well, in wrapping up, I just, I want to thank Chris, uh, my co-moderator for uh, working on, on this session and to all the presenters, um, really appreciate the insights that each of you brought uh, to this session on IT infrastructure. I mean, really, you know, Ken laid out, Ken laying out kind of the, the environment or the, the background based on uh, genomic medicine uh, 13 um, and that research agenda for clinical informatics. It really touched on many of the topics that we've heard over and over again today. Um, things like patient-centered approaches, importance of taking uh, diversity and underserved population needs into uh, consideration, uh, semantic frameworks, uh, data standards, uh, things that promote uh, adoptability, interoperability, data reuse, um, all of those things being so key uh, to making um, genomic medicine and genome or learning healthcare systems possible. Um, so I think uh, Ken really laid out a lot of the, of the overarching themes that have to be paid attention to in this space. And then uh, the two examples we, we got about integrating genomic uh, data into uh, EHRs, um, 
the the use of of HL7 and fire uh, standards as being really key to making these systems possible. Um, and just the very specific examples of how uh, using uh, incorporating the genomic data and having structured genomic results available uh, drives um, both advances and speed of delivery of new information um, from the genome to the healthcare provider, um, but also does it in a way that serves multiple communities, both the clinician, the patient, the researcher, um, sort of facilitating that workflow, um, but also still the need to somehow better do education for physicians and nurses in genomics so that the information can be better appreciated and acted on. And then I think the, the population level example we have of, um, again, the value of having the genomic data integrated into EHR to identify populations of patients with shared, um, shared characteristics uh, for outreach, for follow-up, either for counseling or testing or both, um, and how to do that in a way that um, minimizes the amount of effort that has to be done by primary uh, care uh, givers um, who are already so stressed for time. So I, I mean, I think these were two really great examples that uh, illustrated many of the general uh, ideas that Ken laid out um, from the previous uh, genomic medicine workshop. And so um, I know I missed a lot of very specific points, but but to me that this session was very, very valuable in going from the big picture down to very specific examples. And again, I want to thank the the presenters for for all of their their work for this session. Here, here. Well, thank you. I I think we uh, have completed the session. I know there's been discussion in the chat of ending early, which uh, I guess we'll do. So, Terry. Great. Thank, thanks so much, Chris. Yes, we'll um, we'll uh, adjourn. Take you know one minute off of the uh, the uh, time for the break and and adjourn at uh, sorry and and reconvene at two forty five um, uh, Eastern time. So, however, oh, I need to start my video. There we go. So you can see me, but the message is the same. We'll be back at two forty five and uh, enjoy your break. And, and thanks to everyone for for two really great sessions. Thank you.